and uh, just now, before I begin, uh, let me make sure. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, so it's loud enough? Okay. It's not too loud, is it? Okay. Um, now, before I start, um, I do want to thank you, Steve, for mentioning that I was on Oprah. Uh, that, that's important. Um, you know, I, th I think some would say that um, one appearance on Oprah is worth a thousand journal articles. By the way, thanks also for not mentioning that I was on Jerry Springer four times. I mean, that wouldn't be a good thing. Um, let me also clear the air uh, about something. Now, I want to make sure that you are able to concentrate on what I have to say. Uh, I don't want you to be distracted by what I look like. So, before we begin, I, I thought what we should do is just be upfront about this get it right out in the open. How many of you think I look like Albert Einstein? <laughs> About eight million people have told me that. Uh, three years ago, I was in Northern Ireland, and little children on the streets of Derry whispered, there goes Albert, there goes Albert. I was shocked, I was absolutely shocked. Now, I don't want to waste your time, I don't want to bore you, but I do want to make sure that you're able to focus while I'm speaking, okay? So I have a, a list of look-alikes. I'll go through some of them. These are people that I've been told that I look like. I don't have a lot of time to do this, but uh, in addition to Albert Einstein, some people have told me that I look like David Crosby, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Uh, you know who that is? Anyway, I'm on a diet ever since. Ben and Jerry. How, how could I look like both of them? They, they're not even related to one another. I, I don't get that one. Uh, if you watch the Today Show, a number of people have told me I look like the movie critic Gene Shalit, but he has a black hair. He died, of course. Uh, Jerry Garcia without a beard. Juan Valdez without coffee. Don King with white skin. <laughs> This is a thought-provoking one, Mr. Monopoly. <laughs> this is an oldie but goodie, Captain Kangaroo. I don't know. <laughs> one of my students told me I look like Captain Crunch. But I, I don't want to eat breakfast, so I'm not really sure. Uh, Mark Twain, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, this is insulting, but I'll say it anyway. Grandpa Joe in the old Willy Wonka. <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I walked into Shaw's to do some shopping. I was in the parking lot. Little girl, about eight years old, was holding hands with her mother. and She looked up at me and then looked back at her mother and she shouted, Look, Ma, there goes Beethoven! <laughs> now, I know what... Beethoven looks like, I don't look anything like Beethoven, maybe Bach. And I was telling Jamie about this, it's true, and he said she meant the dog in the cartoon, which I find, Jamie, to be terribly insulting. You know, curiosity about serial murder uh, isn't as morbid as you may think. In fact, I think for most people it's quite harmless. Many people actually escape into the most grotesque, the most extraordinary, the most hideous murders. It's entertaining because it doesn't seem real. It seems more like a fantasy. When, when an individual reads uh, a true crime book, he, may, he or she may uh, see it as a novel, fiction, something that never happened in reality. Uh, and this difference between fantasy and reality, the distinction blurs in the minds of many people. Uh, for example, if you think of Hannibal Lecter, well, he was a figment of Thomas Harris's imagination in Silence of the Lambs and all the sequels, uh, but he, he never was a real character. And Jeffrey Dahmer was a real-life flesh-and-blood killer and cannibal. He lived and he died when he was murdered in that Wisconsin penitentiary by a fellow inmate. Well, the distinction between fantasy and reality uh, sometimes blurs even in my own mind. 
And some years ago, Jamie and I uh, interviewed this killer. His name is Clifford Olson. Have you ever heard of him? You know, there's a good reason. He was Canadian. He's the most notorious killer in Canadian history. And as you know, culture goes north. Uh, there's hardly a Canadian who hasn't heard of Jeffrey Dahmer or Charles Manson uh, or BTK, but, but very few Americans have heard of Clifford Olson. And yet, he, he brutally tortured and raped and murdered 11 children in British Columbia. And when we were with him, Clifford Olson re re requested that we call him Hannibal Lecter. Uh, he, he actually had a glass shield over his cell with a slot for his food. It was reminiscent of the shield that was built to protect Hannibal Lecter's visitors. But in this case, the shield was used and built in order to protect Clifford Olson from the other inmates. They would walk by and urinate on him. Well, they didn't like him that much, you know. I mean, he was a, a snitch. He was a child molester. He was a child killer, and on top of that, he was getting lots of publicity, and most inmates are totally ignored. They get no visitors, they get no mail at all. That's why they hated Jeffrey Dahmer. That's why they don't like Clifford Olson, and actually, since we were with him, he's been relocated to Saskatchewan in a place where it's hard to get to him. Uh, I tried getting him uh, just a few months ago uh, to, to pay a visit, and I, I couldn't even get a letter to him. Clifford Olson... Uh, also while we were there, falsely confessed to committing murders. We, we knew he couldn't possibly have committed, uh, but he was trying desperately to increase his body count so that he would be sort of the Heisman Trophy winner of serial murder, having the largest body count ever amassed. That's how he would feel a sense of accomplishment, a sense of being successful and that kind of theme we have seen over and over and over when we study serial killers well we've been studying serial murder since the early 1980s uh, we did a very small study of serial killers that led to the publication of this book in 1985 it was the first book ever written about serial murder and what started as a small study for me became what I can only call a professional preoccupation. Over the last more than 25 years, I've, I've interviewed lots of killers. I've interviewed their wives and their husbands and their, their, their mothers and fathers. I've interviewed uh, their friends and their neighbors. I've testified in court. I've, I've consulted with the prosecution and the defense teams. And uh, I have to tell you that over this period of time, uh, I've gotten death threats. I've gotten nasty <laughs> phone calls. I, I even had organized crime in my office a couple of times, actually. And as a result, my view of human nature is much darker now than it was 25 years ago, I, I, I must admit. Uh, I'm a little more skeptical about human nature. I'm a little more paranoid than I used to be. And maybe worst of all, I can't even allow myself anymore to think of some of the crime scenes or the autopsy photos that I've seen in the past. Because some of them are so hideous, so, so <laughs> disgusting and offensive that I can't sleep, uh, maybe for months. And I, I always thought that after doing this for more than two decades that I would be desensitized, you know. But it did, and so far it, it hasn't happened, and I doubt very much whether it's going to happen in the future. Um, one thing we want to do is dispel some of the myths, misconceptions, and misunderstandings that have developed around the image of the serial killer. Part of that image comes from Hollywood, you know, when people think of, the serial killer, they think of Jason in Friday the 13th, part 152. Or they think of Freddy Krueger or a whole host of other monsters. But actually, the typical serial killer is an extraordinarily 
ordinary. Serial killers, in terms of their characteristics and behavior, cover the whole range of human characteristics. Nothing more, nothing less. Many serial killers are like Ted Bundy. You know, I, it, it's amazing. People always think, say, oh, he's a, he was a genius. You know, in case you don't know who he was, he, he killed dozens of women across the, the country in the 1970s, and many people still know him, or at least know his name. He, he killed in Michigan, Colorado, Washington State, Utah, and Florida, among others. And he, people think he was just like so smart. Well, if he was so smart, why is he dead? He was executed in Old Sparky by the state of Florida years ago, 1987. And uh, he, um, he, was a, he practiced necrophilia. He flunked out of two law schools. He was his own defense attorney, and he obviously didn't do a very good job. His, his last victim was Kimberly Leach, a 12-year-old girl in Florida, and he shoved her face in the mud and suffocated her. He's hardly an anti-hero. He's hardly deserving of being a celebrity, but as you'll see, that's what we've made him. And you know, he lured his victims by looking so harmless and ordinary. You know, he would, he would walk on the campus of the University of Washington uh, with his arm in a sling or on crutches carrying a pile of books. He'd see an attractive young woman on campus, he'd walk up to her and he would ask her help uh, getting those books over to his Volkswagen Beetle, which was just a few yards away. By the way, it was the old Volkswagen Beetle, not the newer models. And uh, most of the women said yes to him. And as a result, they are now dead. Once he got them to the car and inside, they were completely at his mercy. But he looked so handsome. He looked just this winning smile, this handsome face, who could say no? And uh, the, the, the Calaveras killers, Calaveras County killers, in 1985, Leonard Lake and his good buddy Charles Ng, uh, killed 25 people. But they did it in a way that defied anticipation. What they did was this. They would answer classified ads. And today they go to Craig's list. But they would they, they answer classified ads for, for things like camcorders, automobiles, furniture. They once they got into the home of their victims, they would abduct them. And then they took them out to uh, the woods uh, where they had constructed a torture chamber in the side of a mountain. And they put them in the torture chamber. If they were women, they would rape them. If they were men, they would torture them for days on end. When they had had their fun and, and, and they felt it was enough, they then released their victims into the woods and hunt them down like deer. And maybe the most ordinary person of all was John Wayne Gacy, who killed 33 people uh, <coughs> and buried their bodies in the crawl space under his home. In, a, in the suburbs of Chicago, in Des Plaines, Illinois. Uh, he, everybody loved him. We, we talked to Lillian Grexa, his next door neighbor. Uh, she continued to visit him on death row till the bitter end. And I said, Lillian, how can you visit this guy? Don't you know that he killed 33 people? She said, yes, but I only knew him as a good neighbor. Oh yeah, he was a children. He was a clown at children's parties. He he held theme bashes for the neighbors. He was a big shot in local uh, Democratic politics. I I didn't mention that he's shown here with Rosalind Carter, who was the first lady. Uh, that's Jimmy Carter's wife, and he's been in the news lately. Um, and 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 oh, and by the way, if you're a Republican, don't get so don't get cocky because uh, Ted Bundy was a Republican. So. Uh, we find that serial murder is bipartisan. You know, it, it can go either way. But uh, on the weekend, when his wife was away visiting relatives, John Wayne Gacy would have parties for his 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 secret pals, handsome young men and boys who would come over and.
they would they would engage in drugging and drinking and he'd use handcuffs and sex and torture and and and, and then when he killed them, he would literally cover his the evidence of his passion by dumping their bodies in the crawl space under the house. And uh, the, the stench was horrendous. And on Monday morning when his wife returned, she would say, John, what's that stench? And he would say, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, the sewer is backed up again. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. And he would run down into the crawl space and and he, by the way, could only get 29 bodies in there. He dumped the other four in the river. Actually, it was only three in a river. He teabagged he put one under a barbecue pit at the side of his house and had Lillian Grex's husband help him dig the hole, which ultimately held the body as well as the barbecue pit. But, hey, she says, John, what's that stench? And he's, you know, the sewer is backed up. I'll take care of it. And, you know, People, since Sigmund Freud, people think that w women are stupid. Well, especially wives and mothers get blamed for everything. And if, 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 if John Wayne's gay, gay John, oh brother, John Wayne Gacy's wife didn't know that he was a serial killer, why not? She lived with him. Well, really now, when we smell something in the hallway, when we smell uh, something from coming from under the house, are we supposed to think that it's the smell of decomposing bodies? I know we're cynical, but are we that cynical? John, what are you doing? What are you doing? Is that the smell of bodies? No, I don't, I don't, I hope not, anyway. Well, some serial killers are motivated by money, and, and not many of them, but there have been some. Uh, Dorothea Puentes was a Sacramento landlady. She killed nine of her elderly tenants in order to get their social security checks and then she buried the bodies in the garden in front of, uh, of her house. There were a lot of flowers in that garden. Uh, maybe you know Aileen Warnos, maybe not her uh, uh, in, in, in reality, but certainly from the Hollywood depiction in, in the film a monster. She she would uh, hitchhike on a highway in South Florida, 95, and uh, it, some guy would pick her up, and she was a hooker, and uh, then they would have sex, and she'd take their wallet and shoot him in the head. Maybe not in that order, I'm not really sure. But uh, she did that seven times, and she got the death penalty and was executed. Uh, her original motive was definitely profit. And Malvo and Mohammed, do you remember them? The DC snipers killed 10 people in the New York, uh, not New York, in the Washington DC area, uh, in Maryland and Virginia and DC over a three week period. Now, I don't know whether you, you know this, but they tried desperately to get in touch with Chief Moose. Uh, their motive, and a lot of people still don't know this, their motive was profit. They wanted to make a lot of money, in particular, they wanted to extort $10 million from law enforcement to stop killing. So after they, caught, after they killed five of their victims, Malvo called the tip hotline in D.C. trying to get in touch with Steve, to, to, with uh, Chief Moose in order to negotiate. And guess what? The operator hung up on him four times thinking it was a hoax. Now, before you blame the operator for that, Think about this. There were 70,000 tips. 70,000! How do you manage, how do you prioritize 70,000 phone calls to the tip, tip hotline? How do you know the good ones from the bad? How do you distinguish the, 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 the ones that can help you versus all of those irrelevant and misleading tips? And the reason was that they offered a huge reward. Once you do that, you assure that you will break every pathological liar out of the woodwork. And that's exactly what happened. You know, also, I hate the assumption. The assumption is that people will not help you unless you give them a lot of money. But look at America's Most Wanted. They, they brought to justice hundreds of fugitives uh, based on phone calls from people who watch the show, and they never offer any money at all. So I hate the assumption. 
It's a cynical assumption that people will not help unless they get a big reward. I say don't give it a reward, or if you have to, uh, in order to uh, achieve some uh, sense of uh, visibility, give a small reward. That, that will work just as well. So that explains why Malvo and Mohammed, after the fifth victim, and after they couldn't get through uh, on the tip hotline, started leaving messages. They left messages because that was the only way they had of communicating with Chief Moose. Uh, and, and of course, they got carried away with it, and uh, after a period of time, they enjoyed the publicity they were getting, and they were playing like a cat and mouse game with Chief Moose. And, but those were the secondary motives. The original one was definitely money. Now, most people, when they think of serial killers, they think of sadistic serial killers. And, and so certainly I do too. So the typical serial killer is a sexual sadist. Okay? He kills not for money, not for jealousy or revenge, but in order to feel good about himself, to have fun, to have a thrill. He likes the excitement. He, 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 he kills for the power and the dominance and control that he gets by taking the last breath of life from his dying victim's body. The more that his victim suffers, the greater the pain that she experiences, the better he feels about himself. He's in charge now. He's a big shot. What we see as a despicable crime a serial killer often will see as his greatest accomplishment. The thing that he can do successfully. Maybe the only thing he's ever done to be successful. Uh, a good example is the case of the Hillside Strangler in Los Angeles. Uh, it's hard to see this, but there's the nude body of one of the victims on the hillside. Here it is at, at, at the bottom uh, around Los Angeles. That's why it was called the Hillside Strangler. Stranglers, uh, and actually there were two of them, and at first they thought there was only one, but it turned out to be this guy, uh, Ken Bianchi here, he's uh, feigning remorse. <laughs> he's not really, he's crying because out of regret he was going to spend the rest of his life behind bars. That was his sentence, and he was crying, but he wasn't crying for his victims. I can tell you definitely that was the case, but he and his older cousin, he was 27 at the time, his older cousin Angelo Buono was 42, and Together they killed uh, uh, 10 women in the Los Angeles area. Uh, and as they killed, their, their, their murders got more and more sadistic and brutal. And you know, that's really typical. When I see a really brutal murder, first thing I think of is this is probably not the first. Okay? And, and, and it was certainly true here. Uh, their first victim was Yolanda Washington, upper left-hand corner. Uh, they strangled her and then they dumped her body. By the time they got to the vic fifth victim, and some, by the way, some of these women were really girls as, as young as 12. Uh, they were taking these girls or women back to Angelo Bono's upholstery shop where they lived together, and they would tie her up in a chair and torture her for days on end, doing things like electrocuting her or injecting cleaning fluid into her veins to see her convulse first before they strangled her. And, and, and this idea that the sadism got more and more brutal, the tortures got more and more brutal from victim to victim, uh, kind of reminds me of someone who gets high on a drug and needs larger and larger doses in order to maintain that high. These guys get high on brutality, and that's why they do it. And it's interesting because Jamie and I visited uh, Ken Bianchi in Walla Walla Prison. Walla Walla is water, water. I just thought you'd like to know that. Uh, that's Walla Walla, Washington, Washington State. And, well, while we were there, uh, uh, he, he, the first thing was he seemed like a really nice guy. If I hadn't known that he killed 12, he also killed two women in Bellingham, Washington, two college students there. Uh, and he left some physical evidence, pubic hairs on the carpets in the, in the, in the, at the crime scene. That's how they got him. And when we were in, 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 with him in Walla Walla, he shook hands. And he, his grip was so hard that I really thought I was going to scream. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who have hard handshakes. Don't get me wrong. They're normal people. I understand that. But 
This guy I knew had killed 12 people. When he gave me this hard handshake, I had no doubt but that he was sending me a message. His message was, look, buddy, you may have your PhD and all that, but as long as you're with me behind bars here, I still am in charge of things. I'm the big shot here, and don't you forget it. So we were with him for a few hours, and there was no guard or anything, and then, so we behaved ourselves, of course. But when the guard came back and we were leaving and Ken Diaki, I knew, was going to stay, I decided to get a measure of revenge. So I, I shook his hand and squeezed it as hard as I could, hoping to inflict as much pain and suffering as I possibly could. And he laughed. He knew what I was up to, and he kind of made a fool of me. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's serial killers that have a certain street smarts that you can't ignore. Well, not all of these serial killers, uh, even the sadistic ones, uh, are um, uh, sexual sadists. Some of them uh, are very brutal, especially medical workers, hospital workers, and, and in some cases, physicians. And they, they uh, will express sadism without sex as a vehicle. Uh, Kristen Gilbert, you know, from Northampton, Northampton nurse, uh, killed uh, at least four, maybe as many as 40 uh, patients. And Donald Harvey, upper right-hand corner, was an orderly in a Cincinnati hospital. He killed 60. Um, Dr. Harold Shipman, lower right-hand corner, uh, amazing. He was from England, and over decades, he killed as many as 500 patients. Yeah, he would make house calls to elderly patients who couldn't get out. And while he was there, he'd inject a lethal dose or an overdose of morphine. Killed 500 before he was finally caught. Then he committed suicide. And this guy, Orville Lynn Majors, I, I met him 10 years ago in, on, when I was on Montel. And or Orville Lynn Majors uh, was a male nurse in an Indianapolis hospital. And on his shift, 130 <clears throat> patients died. Uh, and they were pretty sure he did it, but Montel didn't think so. Montel put him on a program called uh, uh, People Who Were Unjustly, uh, 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 unjustly uh, Suspects, I think, who were unjustly seen as uh, having committed murder. And, and in other words, Montel thought he was totally innocent. I did too. He looked so innocent. And that's the thing about these serial killers. They have... They, they look more innocent than an innocent man. They're the last people you'd suspect. And I certainly did think that he was totally innocent. Of course, he had already lost his job as a nurse. And what other hospital was going to hire him? I mean, nobody would ever have him work as a nurse again. And Montel was very upset about that. Two years later, he was convicted. They found the poisons that he used in his van. And there was eyewitness testimony from his roommate that he hated old people and decided he was going to get revenge. Well, people want to know from us how do you protect yourself, and I'm going to really quickly tell you that you can't. When these, these guys, if they want to get you, they'll get you. Here's a, a good case of uh, two guys, again in Los Angeles, uh, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris, who would, uh, during broad daylight, drive by teenage girls, especially if they have blonde hair. They love blonde hair on teenage girls, and they had this van with a custom sliding door. They called it Murder Mac. They'd open the door and just snatch a young girl from the streets, who actually from the sidewalk, and once they pulled her into the van, they would torture her and then kill her. Uh, by the way, what are you supposed to tell the people in Los Angeles? Now, from now on, do not walk on the sidewalk. Make sure you walk in the street. Or how about but make sure if you're going to walk, walk at night. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make any sense. They were only walking on the sidewalk in broad daylight. There's nothing else they could have done, except maybe to put themselves in a room and stay there until they were no longer teenagers. Uh, and once they got these young girls into their van, uh, the, the, the victims were completely at, her, at their mercy. Um, uh, it, they audio taped the torture sessions, which we heard, and uh, in one of them, uh, this this one of the victims is 
is, is saying to Lawrence Bittaker, please, please tell me before you kill me so that I can pray. And Bittaker says, don't worry, we're not going to kill you. He reassured her. He loved the pleading and the begging. Made him feel so good about himself. And then he took an ice pick and he rammed it through her ear. And that's how she died. When you hear something like that, you got to think, that's sick. Well, it's sickening, but is it sick in a psychiatric sense? I don't think so. These guys are not insane. They're not crazy. Uh, most of them are bad, but not mad. And they're crafty, but they're not crazy. There are a few exceptions. Herbert Mullen. Herbert Mullen uh, killed 13 people uh, in California in order to prevent earthquakes. Well, for a four-month period, the voices told him to kill. And he listened to the voices. Uh, by the way, the voices also told him to burn his penis with a cigarette, and he did that too. Maybe that explains why the jury found him not guilty by reason of insanity, and they locked him up for the rest of his life, but in a, in a hospital rather than a prison. <coughs> Uh, but he's one of the few who was genuinely insane, you know, he hallucinated. Uh, most of the serial killers are like Angelo Buono, the other hillside strangler, uh, Ken Biaki's older cousin. Uh, Angelo Buono uh, was, um, uh, was a sociopath. He, I say was because he recently died in prison. A sociopath or a psychopath or antisocial personality disorder. It's, it's not a disorder of the mind, it's more a disorder of character or personality. Uh, and, and it means that he didn't have a conscience. He didn't have what Sigmund Freud called a superego. He didn't, he, he didn't have the capacity to feel remorseful uh, when he made his victim suffer. He didn't empathize with his victim. He couldn't, couldn't do it. There was something missing. He didn't have the internal controls that allowed him to do that. And most of these serial killers are sociopaths. Cliff Olson, this is the same guy that I told you wanted us to call him Hannibal Lecter. I wondered whether he was a sociopath. After we left him, I found out that he had sent letters to the parents of the children he had tortured and killed, explaining how much fun it had been killing their children. That's the mark of a sociopath. And I testified in the case of Caesar Baroni, who killed five people in Hillsboro, Oregon. This was at the penalty phase, deciding whether he would get a life in, in, in life sentence or uh, the death penalty. He got the death penalty. But he, he would kill anything that moved. He loved to kill. And he had nothing inside of him to stop him from doing it. So he killed him. He, all, the only common factor was that all his victims were, were females. But children, adults, one time he killed with a partner, another time, four times he did, did it by himself people he knew, people he didn't know, it didn't make any difference. And these guys think of their crimes as their greatest accomplishments, kind of like somebody who hits a home run ball and wants to keep the ball. These guys keep souvenirs, trophies, mementos uh, of their, the, the, their cherished moments with their victims so that they can uh, relive their fond memories over and over and over again. And so Jeffrey Dahmer, the cannibal killer, uh, was one person who, who kept trophies. He kept photographs, and he would uh, keep hearts and genitalia of his victims in the, in the realm of his refrigerator where he immortalized them. That's what he thought. Uh, and this is a terrible photo, but it's Joel Rifkin who killed 17 prostitutes in Long Island in 1993. Uh, and he would keep... Um, underwear and jewelry and keep it in a little box under his bed and then uh, late at night he'd take it out and masturbate in front of uh, the items. Uh, and and um, Robert Burdella from Kansas City, this is one of his poor victims on the right, would keep detailed medical records. He would kill his victims with poison and he would, he would write the detailed notes about how long it took him to die and what were the side effects and so on. And finally, uh, Jamie and I did this book in 1996 about a serial killer in Gainesville, Florida, who brutally murdered, dismembered, murdered five college students there. And uh, uh, this guy uh, uh, developed 
uh, three crime scenes over 72 hours. Uh, two, two young women were killed at the first, one woman was killed at the second, and then 72 hours later, uh, at the end, uh, a man and a woman uh, roommates were killed. And uh, he, this guy, uh, Danny Rowling, the killer, would excise the nipples of his female victims and put them in a little plastic bag to carry away as trophies. I, the reason that we know that is that the first crime scene, he forgot to take the plastic bag. I guess he was in a hurry, and uh, he didn't make that mistake at the second or third. Uh, what is the origin of, of the sadistic serial killers? I'm glad you asked me. I don't have a lot of time left because I, otherwise I've got to take all the... How long have I talked, by the way? Okay, I'm going to have to stop in about five minutes. So <clears throat> let me just say that many people, when they think of why someone would become a serial killer, they think of the childhood. And I, that kind of makes sense if you stop to think about it. You know, many of these serial killers have suffered. They've been abused, abandoned, sexually stimulated by a parent, uh, adopted under terrible circumstances. They've suffered. But before we get carried away with this, let, let, let me point out that this is an incomplete explanation. Uh, this suffering as a child creates a sense of powerlessness. But there are so many ways that a person can grow up and compensate in a socially acceptable way. And there are millions of people who've been abused as children and they grow up just fine anyway. And they learn to compensate, for example, by becoming a, a, a big business person and, and hiring and firing and wheeling and dealing and makes them feel so powerful and good about themselves. They never kill anybody. So that's just one way. There's so many others. One clue is that these, these serial killers are usually in their 30s, 40s, or 50s when they first kill. If it were really early childhood, or maybe biology, they would have started killing when they were 10, okay, 15, maybe 22. Why do they wait until their 30s or 40s? And my answer is that some people continue to suffer into adulthood. They cannot make the transition. They can't make the transition into middle age. We ought to be looking for those people. They are the people who need help. Even at that late age, we might still be able to prevent a serial murder or two. Uh, and Jeffrey Dahmer was a little different than the others. He was the cannibal that we talked about. Uh, he killed for company. He felt, felt so profoundly rejected uh, that uh, he decided the only relationships he could have would be with corpses. And when people found out about Jeffrey Dahmer, he, he, he brutally, well, I shouldn't say brutally because it wasn't really, but he did kill and then consume the body parts of 17 victims. And everybody blamed his family. Oh, he was abused. That's why... Now we get it. Now we understand it. Well, that just victimizes the family of the killer. If we know, if we've got evidence, that's one thing. But not every family of serial murderers can be blamed. And, and I do not believe Jeffrey Dahmer was abused. And I've talked with his parents. Uh, and, and, and just to make the point, Sherry, his stepmother, never even saw Jeffrey Dahmer until he was 18. How could she be responsible? But everybody thought so. That's a minor detail when you're trying to explain the inexplicable. And this is another one. I don't have a lot of time on this one, but animal abuse. You know, there are millions of healthy people who have abused animals. I, I did a, a study at, at Northeastern of my own students, 400 students, and some 24% of them admitted that they had abused an animal when they were younger. 42% of the men. Okay? But very few of them will maximize the suffering of dogs and cats and do it in an up close and personal way with their own hands. And, and that's a little different. If you can narrow it down to that point, the false positive problem is not as severe. And, and it's interesting that many serial killers use the same method of, of killing and torturing their, their human victims that they used when they were children in torturing and killing animals. So it's kind of a rehearsal. Well, 
finally, in closing, I would like to talk just a little bit about how we catch these guys. And, you know, they're so hard to catch that they're the greatest challenge for law enforcement, that's for sure. Uh, uh, you know, you'd like to think that they're caught because of the great investigative skills of, of law enforcement. Uh, most, most murders are solved within 48 hours, but these guys can stay on the loose for years, even decades. Very few of them are not apprehended ultimately, but not. But it's usually after they've amassed a large body count. Uh, usually they become, uh, you know, they stay on the streets for a long period of time and they start to feel invincible. They, they look over their shoulder, there are no cops, no FBI agents. They're getting away with murder. So they cut corners, take chances. And that's how they're caught. They make a fatal mistake. Uh, some people believe they want to get caught. That's because of one case in the 1940s, this guy, William Aarons, the lipstick killer, he would, after he killed the victim, he'd run into the bathroom of the victim, and on her mirror, in her own lipstick, he would scrawl, please catch me before I kill again. But he is a rare exception. Most of them are like David Berkowitz. They make that big mistake. They would love to stay on the streets longer. He, he double parked at 3 a.m. while he was killing. And uh, he got a ticket. And the ticket was traced back to his apartment. And Joel Rifkin, Joel Rifkin never looked that bad, I don't think. Uh, Joel Rifkin, who killed 17 prostitutes, was transporting the body of one of the, of the women in the back of his pickup. And he was stopped in a routine traffic stop because of a license plate had fallen off of the back of his truck. And uh, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, the Calaveras County killers, they were effective killers but terrible shoplifters. They were shoplifting and they got caught. Police went to their trunk, found, they thought they'd find stolen merchandise, instead they found weapons. And they found the camcorder with which the killers had tape recorded their tortures, and that was used against them in Charles Ng's case. And this is BTK. Remember Dennis Rader? By torture and kill, he gave himself that moniker so he'd be famous. <laughs> By the way, I, I know I don't have any time, but I have to say that every time I think of BTK, I, I, I want to say BLT. I, you just, BTK, BLT, I think of everything in terms of food. It's terrible. But anyway, BTK uh, would taunt the police. He stayed on the loose for 30 years. He never got caught killing. He stopped killing years ago. And then recently, he starts writing to the press. He wrote to the uh, Wichita Eagle. He wrote to the to television reporters, the police, taunting them with these clues again. He felt jealous that some of the other killers were getting so much attention. Poor baby. He was getting none. So he sends a floppy disk to a television reporter and he doesn't realize, I wouldn't realize it either, that it can be traced back to the place you've written it. And that's how they got it. And Danny Rowling, I talked to you about him. He was the Gainesville Ripper that Jamie and I wrote about in 1996. He killed the five college students. He was, uh, he, he, the um, police were very, uh, very uh, happy to hear that, that he was in custody in Gainesville on some other charge, uh, robbery. Uh, and when he was, they knew he was incarcerated, and when they found out that he was from Shreveport, Louisiana, they really got excited about it because uh, there had been a triple homicide eight months earlier in Shreveport, and one of the victims was a female college student whose body was positioned in a way that reminded a lot of people of the of five victims in Gainesville and the way they were posed after <coughs> death by the killer. Well, uh, this 36-year-old drifter was in prison and he got a toothache. Police wanted his DNA and he refused to give it to him. But he went to the prison doctor, dentist, and the dentist excised his tooth, pulled it, with cotton gauze and blood and all, put it in a wastebasket, at which point the task force members came along and retrieved it, and the DNA matched his semen at all three crime scenes. So that's how they got him. Uh, I have to give 
Jamie credit for this because it's so horrible. But it was a case of the tooth and nothing but the tooth. I, you've said that before. Blame him. Blame him. And these, these are the, th the five victims, five beautiful young people whose lives were taken. The middle one uh, was, had a job, part-time job at the Sheriff's Reserve. After, after she was raped and stabbed to death, uh, Krista Hoyt's head was then taken and de she, they, she was decapitated and, and Danny Rowling placed her head on a bookcase, on a bookshelf, so that it was the first thing that the police saw when they opened the front door of her apartment. And the, the students there uh, have um, erected a graffiti board and, and uh, all of the, uh, uh, the students uh, helped to maintain it over the years. <coughs> Well, finally, well, what, how have we responded to these serial killers who are nothing but monsters and do not deserve to get a lot of uh, the positive publicity? Well, we've made them into celebrities, which is exactly what they want. Uh, there are now serial murder trading cards. Many it, We used to put baseball players there. Now we put the killers, and on the back we put their body counts, not their batting average. Uh, there's there are all the serial killers. This is Jeffrey Dahmer. Have their own action figures. If you have a child or a younger brother or sister, you may want to give this as a birthday gift. Uh, just go to the internet, burningchurch.com, and you can get one of these wonderful uh, action figures uh, for your child or your younger brother or sister. They'll love it, really. Uh, here is a, a Jeffrey Dahmer carving set with real bone handles. Uh, this is a book that Danny Rowling, the Gainesville Ripper, wrote with his, his uh, killer groupie girlfriend who loves serial killers. Her name is Sandra London. She's, she, she's, not, she's exempt from the, the Son of Sam law. She can profit from this. And this book could have been bought in Barnes & Noble and Borders. It was everywhere. It contains Danny Rowling's poetry and artwork and music. It's a wonderful book. <laughs> uh, and he even had a website. Charles Manson has a website, mansondirect.com. It's very interesting if you want to go to it. <coughs> Jeffrey Dahmer has, there's a comic book that talks about his crimes and even shows him having sex with one of his victims and, and, and identifies the victim by name. Well, these are dead people. They have no legal rights. People don't understand that. You can't, it's a horrible thing. It's irresponsible. It's unethical, but it's not illegal. And cover of People Magazine, here's Jeffrey Dahmer. This is not a news magazine. And yet, People Magazine, which, which, which has 35 million readers a week, puts dozens of killers on the cover now. Never did that when they did the first 15 years of publication. They wouldn't have dared, but they do it now. And John Wayne Gacy, who buried 33 people, you know, the crawl space guy? He was a clown at children's parties, and on death row, he wrote these, these I mean, he painted these portraits of himself at the level of paint by numbers. You, you want one? No problem. Three thousand dollars. Three thousand. They wouldn't be worth twenty-five cents if he hadn't killed thirty-three people. T-shirts for Ted Bundy and every other serial killer you can think of. Charles Manson. And Charles Manson told me recently that he's the most famous person who ever lived. He said so proudly, the 73-year-old guy who can, still has hundreds of loyal people who would do anything that he wants. Not Geraldo Rivera, but <laughs> the others would. He recently wrote me, and he sent me this postcard. He's an ardent environmentalist now. Air, trees, water, animals. He's, he hates polluters. They're the real criminals, he told me. He should get together with Al Gore. I think they have a lot in common. Not that Al Gore would do something about it. You understand what I mean. They're both ardent environmentalists, that's all. Well, the message hasn't been lost, and this is my final thing. I'll turn it over to Jamie. Um, the message has not been lost on our young people. Those who are being bullied and humiliated at school on an everyday basis, they know how they can become famous now. They know how it is possible that they will no longer be ignored by their peers, like Harrison Klebold at Columbine High, who killed 13 people. And their image is now on a t-shirt. 
You can get it at the same place that you can get serial murder t-shirts on the internet. They got exactly what they wanted, even if it was posthumously. And NBC has done the worst possible thing after Virginia Tech by releasing those photographs of the killer choke, who wanted desperately to be seen as a powerful, dangerous person, not someone that you can afford to ignore. And guess what? He got exactly what he wanted. Thank you.